everybody. I, we actually have a, uh, I, I, see, I just got a message here. Uh, my background, as we just mentioned, is an architecture historian. And about for 13 years, I had a company called the San Francisco Architecture Walking Tour. And I actually took in-person tours of San Francisco Financial District and its architectural gems. But when COVID hit last March, that ended just like a light switch. So that 13 year business pretty much has been closed down. And I actually moved out of San Francisco to Palm Springs. So I'm actually talking to you live today from Palm Springs, where I've created a new version of my tour, which is a new company called Art and Architecture Virtual Tours. And my goal is to celebrate the best of art, architecture, urban history. Of the eight different virtual tours that I give, one of my favorite is the, uh, is the private club access of Diego Rivera's first mural in the United States, which we'll be talking about today. What makes this virtual tour very special is that this is really, for many people, will be the only way you're gonna be able to see this mural since it is in a private club and you have to be a member of that club or know somebody in order to get in to the club to see the mural. We'll go in more detail a little bit later. So right now, the best way of seeing this mural and understanding the history behind it is to do what you're doing today, a virtual tour. The talk today is going to take approximately about 45 minutes to complete. We'll see how well we do, but that is my goal. There will be, as mentioned, a time for Q and A. If uh, questions that you may have about what I've talked about or things that I did not talk about, and I'll do my best to be able to answer it. But you do not need to remember anything I'm telling you today. Well, number one, I understand it is being recorded and I would imagine this might be available for people to view later, but I also will be sending over uh, to everyone is basically a handout. And this handout will list most of all the facts and details I'm sharing with you today. And you can review those at your leisure and be able to get a further understanding. So don't be too like concerned. Oh, you don't need to take notes today about anything. Just sit back and enjoy. So the first thing I wanna do is give you a sneak preview of the mural itself. And I'm just gonna escape out of here. When you walk in the private club and take the elevator to the 10th floor of the club, you're gonna make a left turn and there's going to be a staircase that takes you from one floor, the 10th floor, to the 11th floor. And in the center point is this mural that Diego Rivera did as a fresco on the wall, but also painted the ceiling, which is very unusual for Diego's work. We'll be talking about a little bit later. This mural, I'll go in detail with you later on on my talk. But I want you to know it is probably one of the most uh, important murals of Diego's work. And the question is usually, well, why is that? The reason for that, I'll go here, the view here, is the very first mural that Diego Rivera painted in the United States. So this is the first time that he actually did work here in the, uh, in the Americas. It's the only Diego artwork that is in a private space. Most of Diego's work would most of Diego's work would always be for the public. This is how Diego did his art. He would give access to the general public in public spaces and public uh, public halls and outdoor spaces in order for people to learn about the history of Mexico. So to paint this in a private club was pretty much against his own standards. But I think it was the money that he was offered, even though, as we some of us may know, that his politics were very much to the uh, to, to the right of communism, and very much would not supposed to be taking commissions and money from 
the uh, from, from the other side. But this one commission was over twenty five hundred dollars. He couldn't give it up, and he was doing it for a friend. We'll go a little bit more detail a little bit later. Our story begins with the fact that Diego Rivera meets San Francisco artist Ralph, Ralph Stackpole in Paris. Ralph Stackpole was a very famous artist right here in San Francisco that uh, had a studio on Montgomery Street. Here's Diego Rivera meeting Ralph Stackpole in Paris in 1922, where both Diego and Ralph were in Paris in the early 20s, basically dabbling in different art styles, trying to figure out what was next. They become lifelong friends, pen pals, and will be part of our story today of friendship that accumulates into a commission for Diego Rivera in America. Construction begins on the Pacific Coast Exchange trading floor on Pine Street in the financial district in 1928. This is what it basically looks like if you went on downtown in the financial district right off Market Street is Sansom Street. You go down Sansom and Cross Street is, uh, is Pine Street on Sansom and Pine is the original, basically the trading floor for the Pacific Coast Stock Exchange that is gonna start work in 1928. Construction begins in uh, basically in 1929, right at the beginning and of a new tower that's built right behind the trading floor with the entrance on Sansom Street. So I want you to take a look at this. The lower building is the trading floor for the stock exchange that was built in 1928. And then behind it is a tall tower that is basically, I think 11 or 12 floors. And that is an addition to the building that is attached to the back of the trading floor where the brokers and managers could literally go up elevators to the top two floors, which you see in the long gated windows on top, where they would have a private luncheon club to basically entertain their, uh, their guests or their clients. So decision is made to include a private club on the 10th and 11th for the brokers and managers. It will be named the Pacific Coast Stock Exchange Luncheon Club. In 1930, the Stock Exchange Trading Floor and the Pacific Coast Exchange Luncheon Club opens on 1930, January 4. Diego Rivera is commissioned to paint the centerpiece and symbol for the new luncheon club. But why did he get that commission? If you remember, we go back to Ralph Stackpole and the friendship that Ralph had with Diego in Paris back in the 1920s. Ralph Stackpole is chosen as the artistic director of the new luncheon club. And when the question comes up, who should we bring in to paint the symbol, the center point of the new luncheon club, it's gonna be Ralph Stackpole going, I know somebody, Diego Rivera, my good friend that I met in 1922 and we're pen pals, I'm going to recommend Diego Rivera. Well, that comes with a bit of controversy. Why? because most of everybody that knew the works of Diego Rivera, and he as an artist knew he was a communist. Communist, so why are we choosing a communist artist to paint a mural in a capitalist building? This becomes very controversial, um, but it's going to be the friendship of Stackpole and the architect of the building that will seal the deal. And that will, make sure that in 1931, Stackpole is uh, commissioned to also do two statues in front of the training floor of, of the Pine Street. So he is going to be, the uh, our sculptor is going to be commissioned at the same time that Diego comes in to paint two uh, statues, uh, basically to paint two, sculpt two statues, one representing agriculture, one representing industry. The agriculture is female, the industry is male. And both of these statues sit in front, as you can see here of the trading floor today. So if you went on Pine Street and you went in front of this building, 
you would see these two statues to the right and left, and they are the work of Ralph Stackpole. And the themes of agriculture and industry are basically two areas that the stock market invests in. And you also will see today the mural that Diego Rivera's commission is given the theme of industry and agriculture as riches of California. In 1930, Diego Rivera arrives in San Francisco with his wife, Frida Kahlo. Here they have arrived at the train station in the waterfront of San Francisco, where Diego to the right, Frida here in the center, and guess who on the left? Ralph Stackpole. They, Ralph greets Frida and Diego and actually has them come and stay with him at a studio on Montgomery Street. By the way, that studio on Montgomery Street actually has a plaque on it that lets you know today, if you walk down to the end of Montgomery Street, you will see a building with a plaque that will say, this is where Diego and Frida Kahlo had stayed while they were painting the mural at City Club. And here's a famous uh, por uh, color photo of Diego and Frida in the studio, art studio of his friend, Ralph Steck. So Diego Rivera begins painting his mural on the wall between the 10th and 11th floor luncheon rooms. And here's a great photo of, uh, uh, basically let me get out of the photo and you can see this is where Diego is gonna start working on scaffolding to put the beginning touches on the mural. The mural is going to be a fresco, meaning tempera paints on wet plaster. But before he starts working, he will do a tracing of his work on tracing paper and apply it to the wall and then take push pins to basically outline the, uh, the, 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 the art design and then take temper paint, basically splash it onto the wall and he sees exactly where he needs the paint. And this is an example of him sitting on scaffolding, uh, putting some of the final touches on the mural at City Club. Diego Rivera was known to work 18, maybe 20 hours a day. Uh, definitely workaholic. He would sit in that studio and also using two assistants to help with large blocks of art, of the, of the paint for the art, but also then he would come in and do the detailing. Now here's the issue with fresco. If you make one mistake, you have to go back in and replaster and start all over again. This is why this takes them over uh, probably over a month to be able to complete working long, long hours to finish this mural. So he completes the mural in March, uh, the end of March. Remember, he comes in in April. So at the end of March, he's going to complete the mural. The general public is allowed to come in for one week. People line up or on Pine Street to be able to have access to the mural to take a look at it. Then the doors are closed and the club becomes private. And it's really not until City Club takes over, which we'll touch on in a few minutes, and we'll have basically the general public will have access by members bringing their friends up to see it. So the Pacific Coast Exchange Luncheon Club, the official club for the stock exchange actually closes down in 1987. 1988 is when City Club takes ownership of the former luncheon club at a cost of over a million dollars for the renovations. And this is the front of the building. If you go on Sansom Street, you're gonna see the, what the original tower was called the Stock Exchange Tower and then right below it, City Club. And that is the entrance right there. That is Sansom Street. And you walk through these doors. You would then take the elevator to the 10th floor and you'd be able to be able to see the mural. In 2002 though, the stock market trading floor actually closes also and is sold to private developers and converted to a gym 
by Equinox Fitness. So this is the Equinox sign in front of the uh, old trading floor. So that building, what used to be the trading floor, the lower building, is today a gym, a private gym, Equinox. And by the way, a little tip, if you come to, and hopefully all of you will at one time come down, go to Equinox. They don't really let people in there unless you're a gym member. You can walk in though, just, just act as if you don't know what you're doing. Walk in and you'll see all the original detailing of the trading floor. And there's actually, if you go to the right, you'll there's a little uh, retail store for the gym members. You can pretend like you're shopping and be able to look at the details in the room. So it's extraordinary architecture. Equinox, the private gym company, did a great job of keeping all the original look for the building. So again, looking at this photo in the back is the Stock Exchange Tower, and on the top floors is where City Club and the mural is located. So now let's take a look at the details of the mural. And first, uh, first look is this is the staircase that you're going to uh, see when you come in and you're gonna gradually walk up. And the best way of seeing this mural if you see it in person is to go up the two flights of stairs and there will be a landing and you can look down at the mural itself. So let's do this. And, uh, and every, uh, hopefully everybody has a pretty clear shot of, of this. Uh, of this detail. So the name of the mural, as mentioned, it's Allegory of California, or has two names, also Riches of California. And the two themes that were represented here is agriculture and industry. And once you note on the right side, represents agriculture, and we'll go through each person you see there on the right side and on the left side represents industry. Most importantly, the center most focal point is the female that represents basically California. And California is holding in her arms the bounties of the riches of California. Look at the hand on the right side and basically, California is holding up the fruits, vegetables, the agriculture of California. Now, once you look down to the right, and you see a gentleman in, his, in a brown jacket kneeling over. That is somebody all of you should be familiar with in Santa Rosa. That is uh, Luther Burbank the famous agriculturist who had his private home in Santa Rosa. And uh, basically uh, Diego and Frida had always admired his work. It basically putting strains of uh, plants together and vegetables worldwide known had already passed away uh, during uh, when they were visiting, but they Diego definitely wanted to place him in the mural as representing the father of agriculture. Then for, uh, further down, we see the gentleman in the, uh, in the red shirt that is representing James Marshall. He was the guy who said gold, found gold in, the, uh, in Northern California and basically started the gold rush of California, which of course, is connected to the riches of California. And right below James Marshall is a miner with a mining pan, basically representing all the miners that came in in 1848 seeking gold and seeking the riches of California. So the left side, let's take a look at the left side. The two gentlemen that you see in blue and the pink, the guy in the pink is an engineer. This is representing industry. And the guy in the blue is a machinist. And the machinist and the engineer are looking at each other 
and they have their tools of trade, a compass, a, a microscope, all in their hands. And they are representing uh, industry. Then you come down to the guy in the bib overalls, the red plaid shirt. He's a lumberjack, a lumberjack uh, basically representing the working man. And he has his arm on that redwood tree that's been cut down. And then the tricky part, which is really more appreciated when you see this in person, is the miner down at the very bottom. And look at the hand of, of our California. It's basically, she's reaching down under the ground and lifting up the earth and exposing miners that are below the earth with a pneumatic drill uh, coming out. So basically uh, showing you the whole essence of industry. In the center, we have a young man with an airplane plopped right in the center representing youth. And that actually is taken from a, a real person that is named Peter Stackpole, Ralph Stackpole's son. And Peter Stackpole in the 30s was a photographer for Life Magazine and was well known for his artistic work also but being the friend of Diego Rivera and the guy that got him the commission, Diego wanted to put his son in the mural. So we have Peter Stackpole in the middle representing youth with an airplane that he has control of, basically holding the propeller, as you can see. So putting this all together, you have the riches of California with the bounties of the agriculture and the money of finance. But I wanna go a little bit more detail with you and uh, we're going to take a look at the, this closer look. And I want you to look at the, uh, at the back, you see the oil wells and on the right, you see the uh, shipping industry. And now you have a little closer look at the different uh, people that we just discussed. But what we didn't talk about is the fact that there were symbols, hidden codes in the mural that Diego wanted to let us know about capitalism. Now understand that Diego's work, many of his work all over Mexico had political themes to it. He was telling stories to the mass public and letting them know about the good of communism and what was evil about capitalism. But here in California and in the stock exchange building, a capitalist building, he had to be on his best behavior. Remember his first mural. So he had to make sure he didn't cause too much controversy. So people signed off on this, the management of the stock exchange thinking it was just pretty much a nice mural that told a story about the best of California. But Diego wanted to let you also know the evils of capitalism. And so let's take a closer look how he did that. First hand, I want you to look at this wood structure right behind the shoulders of California. The, basically, this is called a river dredge. And a river dredge during the gold rush is what was used the dredge out the river banks still search for more gold. What did that do? That caused erosion. He's going to make a story, basically an what the impact of capitalism has on our environment. So if we look at the oil wells to the left, and we all know what oil wells does to the environment and the shipping industry. And then here also we have the, uh, the river dredge. This was totally lost to anybody who's, who's seen the mural in the beginning. They just didn't even know what that was. They didn't question it, but it's pretty prominent message that he was giving you. Now let's take a look at this and the, uh, I'll get out the picture here. And here's some really interesting pieces. Uh, let's look back on the left and you can see the engineer and the machinist, the pink and the blue. 
But right uh, below the engineer, you see a pressure valve. That pressure valve is just stuck in, which I find kind of interesting that he did this. I'm gonna move myself over here. He wanted this to denote that when that red arrow gets to the 12 o'clock, there's going to be an explosion, an explosion, explosion of capitalism, building up pressure. So let's look back at the pressure point. You'll see that red arrow. How close is it to the 12 o'clock? So I think he is giving us a little bit of a prophecy here, what's going to happen to capitalism. So the other way that we see that is right behind the elbow of the uh, lumberjack, you're gonna see a uh, red and black little machine. That is called a dynamo. And a dynamo is something that you wind up, wind up basically to uh, cause energy. And uh, when you wind it up and wind it up and wind it up, it will, like a generator, will explode. It will unwrap itself and bring in chaos. So why would Diego Rivera just indiscreetly paint in a pressure valve and a river, uh, basically a generator, a dynamo, it was called a dynamo at the time, but just think of it as a generator, but only to maybe give us a hidden clue. The other is to look at the impact on the environment at the redwood tree cut down. Most of you, even if you're new to the Bay Area, know that redwood trees were prominent here on the West Coast, and we have one major forest of, of redwood trees, and that's Muir Woods. But most of those redwood trees were all cut down to build our Victorian homes out of wood in San Francisco. So he's kind of giving us, again, that little bit of, of, of hidden code of what happens in if when capitalism is out of control. Then I want you to take now again at the young man in the middle, he's basically representing the uh, youth, but let's get back to the propeller. He is in control of that propeller. That is already wound up, ready to fly. But Diego is telling us here, when he, he lets go, the plane will then take off, letting us know the future is with the youth. And he's letting us know and putting, putting the young man center point in the middle with some control. So that gives us a, some of these little hidden secrets that, uh, that is written by, by art, art historians. But at the same time, I wanna share with you, none of this is uh, really written down by Diego. Uh, this is only research that's been done that people that analyze the work of Diego that have written about it, but we really can't prove that he really put those items in there for that purpose, but it's pretty well respected from art historians. That is exactly what he was trying to do. Now, uh, other perspective of the mural I wanna point out is the ceiling, because the other aspect of our, the female, in the middle representing California, she's really bounded down to earth. She's strapped down, she has no fluency. So what Diego is going to do is take the ceiling and in the center point stretched out in her arms is the, the female character representing California released from the bounds of earth and basically stretched out in the heavens. And you see the airplanes and a very unusual androgynous figure floating in space and the sun. When you see this, by the way, in person, which I, again, you're gonna do, I'm sure, you're gonna look up and I want you to look closely at the androgynous figure because when you are downstairs looking up and move around, that will actually elongate and move basically in motion and Diego paints this in a way that is fluid. So you definitely wanna check that out coming through. Before, uh, so putting this all together, the mural itself has a message to share with us 
about the riches of California, the bounties of what made our uh, state so wealthy, but also a message about the evils of capitalism. But before I leave this mural, go to the next subject, let's go back to basically to Luther Burbank. Luther Burbank, our Santa Rosa guy there in the brown shirt. Frida Kahlo was, remember here at the same time, Diego actually painted in the city club rooms and was very busy doing her own artwork. Diego and Frida both went to Santa Rosa to visit the home of Luther Burbank. And Frida discovered, and if you haven't been to Luther Burbank's home, you will find out on your own that when he dies, he has in his will that he's be buried in an oak, under an oak tree in, his, uh, in front of his home. And if you go to the house today as a tour guide, a tour guide will tell you that story. This fascinates Frida so much that she paints her very own oil painting in 1931. And this is Luther Burbank in a Frida Kahlo, very surrealist uh, style. You see Luther Burbank with his plants and then below the skeleton of being the burial, but getting the life form from nature. So this is Frida Kahlo, 1931. It's not been in museums, it's in private hands and it was painted at the very same time that Diego was doing his mural coming through. So, uh, the also what was interesting here is the pneumatic drill at the, at the bottom. These miners have been also representing what they're doing to the foundation of capitalism. Taking a look at a very Cuba style of art drawings and ramming this pneumatic drill that seems will collapse everything above it because the mural itself has a, the bottom, the middle and the top. And here the miners are basically uh, undoing the foundation of California and also to capitalism. Diego Rivera also is painting in many different styles here. He has the cubism that he learned in Paris he also has his uh, artistic detail of, of the, let's go back to this and look at the drawings of the oil wells. He was a big fan of Leonardo da Vinci of his uh, engineering drawings. So he wanted to show you as an artist how uh, detailed he can be. So the detail of those oil rigs are very, very uh, detailed and show you that he could paint in many, many different styles. In fact, the, uh, again, looking at the uh, one thing that nobody's been able to figure out at the foot of the young man, you see this, what we think is an oak tree, but it's just stuck there for no real reason that we know of, except to represent his basically uh, abstract style of painting. So he's got cubism, abstract. He's got the mirrorless painting. He's, he's got many uh, different aspects of styles of painting that he's doing in here. So a very one, uh, just a very, very special uh, detail to it. Okay, um, what I wanna to get towards, uh, we're getting towards the end here is that I want to uh, let you know that not only is this mural important in, in uh, Diego's work, but San Francisco actually has three different murals and we're the only city in America with, with that. So let's take a look at those three murals. One is the uh, one we just talking about at City Club, Allegory of California, 1931. Then uh, we have at the Art Institute up in Russian Hill, we have a mural that he paints literally one week after he finishes the city club mural he goes to the art institute up on jones street and he paints this mural called making of a, a fresco and he does it in fresco style in the student union building at the art institute take a look at the scaffolding and there is diego rivera on scaffolding uh basically sitting uh on the scaffolding overlooking the work you could do another ho talk on this mural by itself. 
Uh, the Art Institute is going through a little controversy right now. Uh, they're having financial issues. And there was a question of what to do with this mural because it's basically private, privately owned. If the Art Institute goes away, what happens to the mural? I guess we have the same question with City Club. If City Club goes away, what happens to Diego's mural at City Club? But supposedly uh, this is now still in a bit of controversy, who's gonna take control and how is this going to remain where it is and not be moved or painted over? Another mural that's pretty much unknown by everybody, and that is a uh, mural that was uh, done in a private home. Uh, when Diego is done with the mural, the two in, uh, that I just mentioned, he's going to be commissioned uh, to go up to uh, Roberta Stern up in, in, in the, uh, by, by Palo Alto, and in her hallway will do the still life of her grandchildren and basically her orchard that she had in her yard there. And it was painted in her entryway in 1931, showing you another beautiful style that Diego did called Blossoming Almond Trees, 1931. To see this mural today, where it's located is in, in Cal Berkeley. And you have to go to the women's hall called Stern Hall, named after Roberta Stern, who had this commission, and just go up some stairs and you'll be able to see this mural, 1931, Still Life by Diego. So all three of these murals here in uh, San Francisco is very, very unusual to have. But actually another mural that's going to get a lot of public attention is a mural that Diego did for City College in 1940. In 1939, the Treasure Island World's Fair is going on. Diego is going to be commissioned to do a huge four or five different panels that is called the Pan American Unity Mural. This mural is now closed to the public. You can't see it because the building is going renovation but it is, uh, it is to let you know that in about another year, only delayed because of COVID, it's going to be taken over the SF MoMA. SF MoMA will present this mural in its full display at the lower level of SF MoMA where public access is gonna be free to come in and see this beautiful uh, 1940, the last mural that Diego did here in uh, San Francisco. So uh, pay attention. Uh, the news is going to be coming out uh, probably by the mid-year uh, of, of next year of this mural being in full view of the general public. So all of these pay attention to is pretty, it's really pretty amazing to see. So that in a capsule form is the work of uh, Diego Rivera here in uh, San Francisco. And I'm hoping that everybody here gets be able to get an access to see the mural by getting get to know somebody. And I think you do all know somebody that may be able to get you in. But uh, we'll leave that to a further discussion. So that brings us kind of officially to the end of our program. And it's time to answer some questions that anybody has. So um, I can, how, how would you like to do this? Uh, do you want to? I, I'm looking at the chat right now, Rick, and I don't see that we have any questions. We just have some comments saying, great, if you could return to talk about the Art Institute mural or any other art because you're great and you're also interested. Oh, so well, I think that thank you. everyone has found this very interesting. And I did want to let everyone know that I am a member of the City Club. I worked for the Pacific Exchange for a number of years. So when everything opens up, we will do an out and about lunch at the Pacific, um, I mean, at the City Club. And hopefully Rick will be able to join us and give us a little bit more detail. Yeah, I would love to do that. Yes, I think it would be great. The gate, I would love to be able to get, because I used to do, um, just to let everybody know, I used to do what you're doing virtually in person with people that came in to see the mural 
and we just talked about the mural in detail because seeing it live is going to be a whole different experience. Yeah, so, particularly the ceiling. So here's some other questions. Let's see. Uh, it looks like Diego's wife, Frida, had a big influence on his art, and we can see her likeness in some of his art. Is that yeah? Is that the case? Well, it's interesting. Uh, Frida Kahlo, is, is, you know, I love her work, but I, all of us probably kind of aware that her work did not even get noticed until about the 70s. Mm -hmm. She was pretty much always considered the wife of Diego Rivera. And Diego loved her work, but he was the artist. And she was basically the wife who dabbled in painting. <laughs> and that's kind of turned around now. And who's most famous is Frida Kahlo. And that is pretty much because of social media. Let me prove that we have a little bonus uh, here. And at, this is our, a, a piece of work that Frida did. And this is called the, the wedding photo because part of what's fun about this whole story of City Club's mural is the commission that he gets to come here coincides with the marriage of Frida Kahlo and uh, Diego Rivera. They had just got married about five months before they came to San Francisco. So this was like a honeymoon for them. So this painting you're seeing right now is the work of Frida Kahlo and today owned by SF MoMA. So if you go to MoMA and you go up to the main floor, you will see this painting and it represents pretty much look who's uh, and again i could we could talk 30 minutes on this painting alone but very quickly on that question look how diego is portrayed holding the palette of the paints and the paint brushes <laughs> and frida is basically on the right side smaller stature of course and just barely touching his hand she is insignificant to the artistic world of diego rivera in this painting that's how she painted herself coming in and so that's a whole story about this painting is wonderful. It was done exactly the same time the City Club mural was done at, at uh, basically 1931 coming through. Great. Let's see, there's also a question there. Murals at Beach Chalet and Coit Tower are similar in style. Do you know anything about those artists? Yeah, very good uh, question uh, because there's always some confusion about, uh, uh, about uh, the Coit Tower and murals were they done by Diego Rivera and they were not any done by Diego Rivera but all inspired by Diego Rivera. When uh, Diego Rivera comes to City Club 1931 he's going to inspire many many artists. In fact part of the controversy when he first came in is that the local artist said wait a minute why is we why are we bringing somebody in from uh, Mexico who's a communist <laughs> to do this important piece of work when we got great artists right here in San Francisco. So there was a lot of pushback. But when it was all done and the attention that went to the work of Diego at City Club's mural, uh, artists basically looked back and said he brought attention to this, this culture and basically to fresco painting. And this inspires uh, a uh, uh, all the artists that over 12, 14 artists were brought in the Duke Coit Tower with a best friend who was actually a protege of Diego Rivera, the Russian artist, Victor Onatov. And Victor Onatov, uh, and by the way, he actually paints Victor Onatov in his mural, uh, in, in his mural. So let's see if I can, okay. The guy in the bib robe overalls, <laughs> right there the lumberjack is Victor Onatov. He paints his best friend and it is Victor Onatov, Russian artist who is then uh, commissioned to be the artistic director of Coit Tower bringing the influences of Diego's work to Coit Tower. <laughs> so all those stories are interconnected uh, together. That's for sure. So any other I got one more bonus uh, photo to show you. And one question that usually comes up, uh, if, if Diego Rivera is known usually to paint himself into his murals. Think like Alfred Hitchcock, as we all know, as a movie director, would always somehow get himself into his work. So a lot of people are asking, where is Diego in our City Club mural? So let's go back to, the, to the, where we can see 
the mural from a, from below looking up. And this is now this is not proven, but scholars have actually done trace drawings. And what they think is the image of Diego is the sun. So look at that sun and you look at the expression and we have our, our historians have actually had tracing paper and matched this with drawings of Diego's face and be able to match it up. Now, how perfect would that be, right? Because here's Diego in his work, looking down at the work that he did. So when you go, uh, you actually go see the mural, look at, for that. And you also want to look for at the very bottom, right etched on uh, where the stump of the tree is a signature of uh, Diego Rivera. He actually signed it in red. And you'll be able, you'll be able to see that also. So that, bring, unless you've got some other questions, basically the end of my discussion. As I mentioned to you, I want to make sure you all get a handout that will have all these dates on it and the names that you can refer to. And then fingers crossed, one day, because you're also close to get to City Club to see the mural in person. Absolutely. Yeah. And there was just another comment. Um, someone who let us know that she'd worked for decades in the financial district and noticed your architectural tour groups walking around. Try to listen in while passing by, but a wonderful talk today and glad to hear that you have tours available online. All right. Yes. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Right. Rick, this was absolutely stunning. We really appreciate it. I thank um, Mimi and Kathy for arranging our speakers. We're so happy about that. And remember next Pamela Jean will be talking to us. Uh, she's from um, Sonoma Water. So hopefully she'll be talking to us about uh, water issues that we're facing here in Sonoma. But Rick, thank you so much. I will um, get, send you my email address so you can send the handouts and I will share them with everybody who joined the meeting and also those who weren't able to join but who were interested and the recording will be available. So if any of you have friends who want to uh, watch the recording, please, uh, we'll send out something in our um, staying in touch with the uh, links to the, uh, to the recording. So again, Rick, thank you so much. This was fascinating. Appreciate All of you, remember, we will be, we'll be going to the City Club soon, okay? okay. <laughs> right. bye -bye. So much. Right. Thank bye -bye. you.